Good evening. Thank you very much for coming. Who is this large group in the front? Who are you? Woohoo! Thanks for coming. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm wondering how many of you in the audience will be experiencing um, Messiaen's Oiseau Exotique for the first time. That's the first piece on the program. Exotic birds. Okay. I'm really glad that your first experience of this piece is live. Um, it's a monumental work for Winds, and it's one of Messiaen's masterpieces. The first time I heard it, was in a music history class, back when we called it music history and not musicology, in the 80s. Um, and it was the, uh, sort of a survey course, and we were just told to go listen to it as part of a 20th century. And I hated it. I didn't even get to the end of it. I thought it was loud and strident. I didn't understand it. Um, I didn't get what he was going for. Uh, and it wasn't until well, probably 20 years later, when I was at Eastman, where I experienced it live, where I just went, oh my goodness, this is incredible. It's an incredible piece of music. But because I had that experience, we thought it might be helpful to you um, to get a little bit of knowledge or some things to hang on to orally before you listen to the piece for the first time. So we asked Professor Simpson Litke to give um, a brief talk about the piece. She is a Messian expert, and we're just thrilled to have her here, so please welcome her to the podium. It is my pleasure to speak to you for a few minutes tonight about the 20th century French composer Olivier Messiaen and his fascinating piece, Oiseau Exotique. If you are familiar with Messiaen's music, you likely already know that much of his compositional output is religious in nature. He was a deeply devout Catholic and served as an organist at the Église de la Sainte Trinité in Paris for most of his life. Messiaen viewed music as a way to tackle some of the most complex and challenging aspects of his faith. Huge and awesome concepts like the nature of God and eternity. Things that are extremely difficult, if not impossible, for us as mortals to truly understand. These were the kinds of concepts he explored musically through his compositions. The grandness of his subject matter and the spectacular ways in which he represents it, using huge orchestral forces, large blocks of contrasting musical materials, and very long and complex cyclic structures. This makes Messiaen's music at times overwhelming for us as listeners, but always extremely exciting and thought-provoking. In some ways, Messiaen's love of birdsong might seem at odds with these grand religious themes in his music. But if you listen to the ways in which he talks about birds, these little servants of immaterial joy, as he calls them, they clearly tie into his overarching beliefs as well, perhaps in a more intimate and personal way. In this first video that we'll show over on the screen there, we see Messiaen, the ornithologist, out in nature, transcribing what he hears and marveling at the beauty and complexity of these tiny musicians' songs. As Mu Messiaen's teacher, Paul Ducat, used to say, listen to the birds, they are great masters.
to give you a sense of what to listen for in this piece before the wind ensemble plays in its entirety, we would like to highlight a few important excerpts. This first excerpt is found both at the beginning of the piece and at the very end, creating a kind of large scale cyclic structure. This loop where beginning and ending become one reflects on the concept of eternity, where our mortal conception of the passing of time no longer applies. Indeed, the ending of the piece gives the listener the sense that it could continue on, reverberating beyond into our natural world as we leave this concert hall. Messiaen's description of the bird call that is represented here, that of the Himalayan white-crested laughing thrush, shows that his interests extend beyond Western religion, incorporating the rhythmic, melodic, and spiritual ideas of ancient Hindu and Greek traditions as well. At times in this piece, we will hear specific birds being highlighted as soloists. Let us examine two such passages that return several times throughout the piece. In his detailed preface to this score, Messiaen writes that we should not forget that this work is highly colored. It contains all the colors of the rainbow, including red, that color especially associated with hot countries the color of the American bird known as the cardinal. Indeed, color was particularly important to Messiaen, whose condition of synesthesia meant that sound and color were inextricably linked in his perception. When he heard sound, he literally saw visual colors. He uses colorful musical language then to depict both the birds and elements of their surrounding physical environment. Note the performance instruction to the pianist to mimic the liquid nature of the bird call by playing as fast as possible, brilliant like the rattling of water drops. <laughs> In this next solo, the mysterious descending call of the prairie chicken is depicted by the winds, while the percussion, particularly the gongs, evoke the puffy-cheeked grandeur of the male bird's mating display. At times in this piece, we will hear successions of bird calls, one after another in a call and response kind of format. However, Messian also places the birds into more direct dialogue in some passages of the piece as well. In this next excerpt, we hear a duet between two birds, the bobolink and catbird, represented by different hands of the piano. You will notice that the excerpt begins with Messian's musical translation of the catbird's meow. Finally, as Messiaen works from transcription to musical translation and artistic manipulation of birdsong, we hear even more complex dialogues emerging between the birds. In this last excerpt, we see that four different bird calls are heard simultaneously in a multi-voiced polyphony. The ensemble will play each of the calls individually and then will synthesize them together into a joyful cacophony of bird chatter. There is a large section of this type of texture in the middle of the piece.
you will notice that the birds represented in this piece, of which we have highlighted only a few, come from all corners of the world. And so rather than depict a scene that is literally faithful to nature, as he does in some of his earlier birdsong works, Messian has chosen in this piece to create a fantasy world where birds from different countries come together in a grand conversation. <laughs> To close this pre-concert discussion, I would like to play one more video for you. Here we will see how Messian takes the bird calls from nature, enthusiastically and joyously imitates them himself, and then translates them into his own musical language with the help of his beloved wife, the famous virtuosic pianist Yvonne Lorio, who premiered many of his works, including this one. Indeed, it has been suggested that Messian's whole way of imitating birdsong might have been different if he had not had such an insightful collaborator and loving companion to work with. Et voici le Rossignol. Il éclate tout d'un coup brusquement. Le, la seconde strophe, ce sont des batteries sur deux sons très sévères. Ticot, 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 ticot. Voici le râle de gelée. C'est étrange ce rythme yandique, brève longue que l'on entend dans les hautes herbes de la prairie. C'est lui qui fait. And now, please enjoy Olivier Messiaen's Oiseau Exotique.
Thank you. 
Thank you.